2018. We've uh, spent the first day of this annual meeting doing a quick whistle-stop tour of the global commons, talking, taking in the, our cultural commons, our social commons, our digital commons and our ocean. Today we're looking at the more structural and endemic uh, elements and, and, and crises shaping our world in 2019. We've just come from a session focusing on international terrorism uh, on the back of disturbing new events in uh, Eastern Africa. And now we're looking at what unfortunately is a, a perennial problem, the problem of, cor of corruption. It was my pleasure to have a, a session on this subject two years ago. I, I, I fear that it may not be the last session we have, but there has been a lot of progress since in both directions. One in four people today in 2018 were forced to pay a bribe. To give another bit of perspective, I did some very unscientific numbers on the uh, subject using media um, analysis. Two and a half million times corruption was mentioned in news stories around the world in 2016. Three million times in 2017. And in 2018, 3.5 million times. So corruption is as much on the agenda as, uh, as it has ever been. Is this a good sign? Is, is this a bad sign? Are we just talking about it? more because we know much more about it. My name is Oliver Kahn, I'm Head of Strategic Communications here at the World Economic Forum. I'm going to briefly introduce our guests and then because we don't have a lot of time for this issue briefing, I'm going to uh, start with a, a round of questions and then hopefully we can move into a, a much more interactive phase. Please feel free to stick your hand up, interject, um, uh, unleash your own opinions and thoughts and ideas into the conversation at any opportunity. I encourage disagreements wherever you feel it's necessary. Uh, <laughs> agreement if you have to. Let's keep this uh, fast moving and energetic. Um, so on my immediate uh, left, Marjorie Crouch, the founder and executive chairman of APCO Worldwide, a business leader who has uh, been very much engaged in our community um, fighting corruption over the years. Um, next we have Mokwetsi Eric Kibatswe Mazizi, president of Botswana, entered office in 2018 and has, uh, has made a lot of progress and covered a lot of ground in that short time. Delia Ferreira Rubio, you're the chair of Transparency International, based in Argentina. Um, need, we don't need to explain much more about Transparency International. Suffice to say, the global benchmark in a, a week's time will be publishing new data on this one. We're still very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts and your insights. Matthew Carana Galizia, the director of the Daphne Car Carana Galizia Foundation in Malta. You're also an investigative journalist. Um, right, well, let's start with you, Delia, because we rely on your data mm -hmm. to get this conversation started. It has been more in the news, this subject. Is this a better, is this a good thing, or are we just getting better at spotting corruption? I think we, we know more, and we have seen in the last years uh, a move towards putting an end to impunity. That means uh, corrupt guys has been brought to justice, and uh, that gives the opportunity to, to portray this big, big problem, which is perennial, as you say. I think we will not um, uh, get rid of corruption at all. The, what we need is to be ready to face the problem when it appears. And that's the difference between countries in our CPI, our Corruption Perception Index, uh, the new uh, issue will be presented next uh, Tuesday. Um, the difference between countries is not um, that there is something in the DNA that says you are free from corruption or you will have corruption. Corruption may appear in every country and in fact it occurs in any country. The difference is how countries react against corruption, both from the institutional point of view and from the social point of view. That is, the society reacts against corruption or it is indifferent to, to corruption scandals. And um, we think that we have to keep on fighting together to create the, the proper infrastructure to fight corruption and also to make people aware that the victims of corruption are we, the individuals, the citizens. So we must engage together with governments and private sector and particularly investigative journalists in order to fight this uh, real evil. Thank you. And of course we have government business and civil society represented on this panel. Uh, and the infrastructure we'll go into, but first of all let's talk about the reaction you talk about and what, what has changed over the past year, two years. We've seen the Paradise Papers 
the, you know, the, the Panama Papers before that, mm -hmm. uh, huge amounts of media interest in mm -hmm. that. I'd actually like to know your opinion to whether you think you've been satisfied with the response or whether it has de delivered a, a, a somewhat of a fatigue in the way that endemic crises become so 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 day to day and and, and, and and commonplace that people just give up and just get on with it. I think that we have to create the channels uh, in order to organize the energy of citizens in what I call the after um, the after indignation phase. So in the first moment when we are aware of these kinds of problems, the, you have the reactions, mobilizations, people in the streets. But then people have to go back to ordinary activities. So we have to create the, the channels to uh, make this energy available in the post-indignation mm -hmm. phase of scandals in order to foster participation of people, engagement, dialogue, um, activities from citizens in order to monitor and report on public services, on public contracts, or the ways of uh, public resources, for instance. But we have, as civil society, to create these channels to be safe and proper and easy to use for the people. A fascinating introduction of the term, the, the, the indignation phase. And, and Matthew, we're going to come to you on this one. No, nobody has been in the indignation phase more than yourself, of course. First of all, um, Mr. President, I'd like to come to you. You've been in office only a short time, but you've made fighting corruption one of your main priorities. How would you score your progress so far? <coughs> Well, let me begin by thanking the organizers of the event, um, yourself, the panelists here, for um, having us. Botswana has historically fought corruption, and uh, clearly all my predecessors have done the same. And it uh, involves a whole lot of other people, and uh, not just myself. It's a responsibility of all citizens, so we see it as a civic duty for everybody to fight corruption in order to realize clean government. Um, our fight of cor uh, against corruption is articulated in the public space uh, through the public sector, private space and uh, private sector, civil society and academia. So the collaborative um, efforts of all these are essential to fighting uh, corruption. And so uh, Botswana was also founded on very strong principles of good governance. And so it was quite a, a comfortable step for me to um, continue ahead with the uh, investigative uh, directorate in corruption and economic crime, including the Financial Intelligence Agency, FIA, as oversight institutions um, to fight corruption, along with the legislative ones. We have the uh, Public Accounts Committee in Parliament that has a, a responsibility to um, look, at, look over government. I have specifically since coming to your office, uh, to be precise, on the 1st of April, when I um, um, had my inaugural speech, um, stated that it's my desire, very deep and um, uh, uh, strongly held view, that we should have a Declaration of Assets and Liabilities Bill. If you're going to fight corruption, it's important to have a baseline. A baseline by which you will judge me as president. I come in, I have three suits, two pairs of shoes, one vehicle that works and one that doesn't work. <laughs> and at the end of my term, Check the difference and factor in the income I've had. So the other vehicle might be working or one might be replaced. But if all of a sudden I have um, an apartment in Davos and I drive the latest um, Ferrari, <laughs> you know, Ferrari, or, um, and, uh, then, then there is a, an issue. Uh, and I would want us leaders particularly to be held accountable. Um, and this, this declaration, I hope, would be um, had every year for politicians and senior civil servants um, alike, um, particularly people who have um, influence. And there's a simple reason for that. I mean, I'm not going to be demanding this of every citizen. We are leaders. And as leaders, people draw inspiration and they look up to us. We are a role model. And if something really bad happens to someone like me, because I stole public funds, they would be scared to imagine what might happen to them if they stole 
So it's a deterrence um, in some respects. Um, so we want to thank Transparency International, which is constantly um, looked at what we do, but we remain dissatisfied with what we score and what we get. Because in this race against corruption, there is no finish line. So our bottom line is to remain constantly uncomfortable. And that's what our contribution to this initiative is. Uh, and finally, you know, technology is a big help. Um, but it can also be a big challenge um, in our efforts to try and uh, fight corruption. And because our biggest efforts are spent on prevention of corruption, um, which uh, yields much more returns. I need hardly get into the positive um, uh, rewards you get out of fighting corruption. Um, stability, one, predictability, uh, confidence, development, growth, equity, happiness, satisfaction, you know, all, almost all the, the attributes you can think of. So we as a country wish to be all those in the shortest possible time. And I'm sure Dili will, um, when, when she comes to producing her, her next report, laud your, your ambitions in the Declaration of Assets as being quite a very far-sighted um, piece of legislation. And yet, you've made some tough decisions over the past few months as well. And you've, you have gone up against uh, you know, head-on vested interests. Tell us about how hard the challenge has been so far. Well, I'm here. <laughs> and I hope to keep going. <laughs> You know, you, when, you, when you become president of a country, uh, you know, you, that's what you are. And you've got to do it, act it. So I, I will act it and, uh, and do it. So however hard it is, you've got to do it. So um, I, I enjoy my work as president. And it's not that I enjoy, you know, taking the decisions that sometimes I have to take. But overall, I enjoy it. So I'll, I'll hopefully convince the people to vote for me again and then I'll continue. But if they don't, I go home. We'll come back to these points, I'm sure. Um, Marjorie, we'll move to the private sector. Now you've been on the front line of international business for, for a, a great long time, building up a worldwide 35 business. 35 years. 35 years, and building up a business from, from a small foundations into an international, international establishment is going to give you a unique view on the kind of challenges that business leaders face. So um, my company is a consulting firm, so we help a lot of businesses enter markets, um, get established, interact with government, which means that um, we see a lot of this interaction very firsthand. And, um, you know, about half of the places, we're in about 35 markets around the world and with offices. And, um, and so as we've done that, you know, about half of those probably score below 50 on your rankings. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so one of the things that I think people count on us for and use us is because we, um, we have a lot of integrity and we do a lot of training to try to avoid corruption to begin with. So we try to help the companies um, understand uh, who they're dealing with, um, what could happen, uh, how not to put themselves in a position uh, where they're asked for something. But also, um, I think that we, and it, we've learned a lot because when you hire also hire a lot of local people, you realize that sometimes the whole idea of corruption is not something they recognize as corruption. Mm -hmm. So you have to do a lot of education. And I've, uh, people around the forum I know have heard me say this before that uh, education is really the first uh, defense because if you don't understand right from wrong or what is acceptable behavior, you're not going to be able to act uh, in that way. And then I think the, the, the couple of things that I would say that just are maybe useful is, uh, first of all, I think that the bigger companies, the ones with the real financial might, um, really need to help the smaller companies that are much more susceptible to uh, being asked for bribes because the bigger companies, you know, have uh, especially the ones that come from countries um, that have um, consequences to paying bribes, like the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act or something like that. Um, you know, they 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 are now at a point where these bigger companies know how to know how to act, but they need to be helping the smaller companies because those companies don't have the resources to really fight in the same way. And I think the, sec the second thing that I would say is that, um, you know, I think you really need to understand um, what the pattern of the com country is. And, um, you know, we work a lot with the countries that are also trying to 
do what you're doing, and I really commend that. And one of the things that I've been known to, to say around here is that I think we have to do more with the business community to kind of name and fame instead of name and shame. Um, and so to highlight the people really trying to make an effort because if, um, you know, if companies make a point of saying, I'm coming to Botswana, I'm coming somewhere because I know I can invest and feel good about my investment, then that's going to attract other people and that's going to make it easier for you to implement certain kinds of things that you need to do. So I think the whole uh, government private sector partnerships are, are really useful. And one thing we've also learned is, um, you know, sometimes don't put yourself in a position where you're alone when you're negotiating some of these things because it really does cut down on the number of asks when there are other people present because most of this uh, doesn't, um, you know, doesn't happen in the open. And I'd say the last thing, I totally agree with your point about technology. I think that, um, and I'm glad to see the whole Tech for Integrity platform being developed um, with the forum, with Citibank, and, um, and, and I think that the idea that there's less money floating around makes it even harder because it's, there, it's much more transparent when you have to have these uh, actions that are, uh, you know, that are cashless transactions. Uh, the temptations get taken out, the middlemen get taken out. And I think that's a, a really useful um, direction in which to go. And I'd like to explore technology because, as you say, the transparency is a, is a, is a gift, but uh, there's also a great burden by um, the, the, the ability to move money seamlessly around the world as well. So it so, seems to be a double-edged sword. A couple of things I'd quite like to pick up on. I, I like your naming and faming, I, I, mm -hmm. I guess, as a, um, from seeing the, a muted response to the Paradise Papers after the initial Panama Papers, I, I wonder if there's a, a, a fatigue coming in of, of, of naming and shaming, sad though that may well be. Um, I'm intrigued by your point on helping the supply chain. In sustainability, we have um, a fairly well kind of recognized need for the big companies that they, that to, to work with their supply chain and to improve the sustainability practices. Are we seeing something similar in corruption, or is it, is it, is it, are we a long way from that yet? No, I think that, I know a couple years ago at the G20, there was a real effort to put the plight of the smaller businesses on the agenda to make sure that it didn't get lost because the people usually at the table are the bigger companies. And I think that um, there's not a recognition of, of the kind of pressure that's on the smaller companies. Uh, even to get such things as a, a license to open an office or something like that. So I think that, that the more that the bigger companies can help the smaller companies. And, um, you know, I was involved in a, another initiative in Africa, actually, where that involved a lot of women. And the women who were the smaller providers were having a lot of trouble at cross-border, um, not only being shaken down for money, but also unfortunately, um, for they were being raped or they were having to do sexual favors. And we got some of the bigger companies involved. UPS took a lead in this. And it made a big difference when they were there at the, you know, make it, laying down some rules and making sure that, that they were providing some protection for the smaller businesses. And just one final point for this phase of the session. Um, we talk a lot about the being a multi-conceptual world at the moment, different poles of power, subscribing not only to different different national interests, but also different values and different ethics. Are we seeing a reticence on the part of, of big business to comply with anti-corruption rules for fear that that may cost them big contracts and lose out in the long run against competitors who I, I don't have the same quality? I think it does cost contracts. And, but, you know, it depends what you stand for. And ultimately, you have to hope that the values you stand for um, rule of the day. I think the Pachi community that's come together around the Partnership Against Corruption initiative that the forum has done has, has elevated some of those companies and helped with kind of collective action or working together on some of this. But yes, I think that there are still companies that think that, um, that bribery is the way to go. And, and it does exist. And, um, you know, until there's a good, um, until, you know, I think we keep trying to squeeze more and more out of the system. But I think, you know, and I'll, this will be maybe my last point on this, I think the one thing that we really have to focus on, you can't teach people values when they're 40 years old. Yeah. You know, this starts when people are very young. They have to learn right from wrong. And we don't do enough. We do a lot of preaching on corruption and what, you know, what is right, you know, calling, calling out people. But we don't start early enough to 
Um, you know, whenever we've done polling on this subject, young people really think that corruption <coughs> destroys their future. They really um, understand, I think, the essence of why this is an important issue. So how do we pick up on that and make sure we start when people are in elementary school or when, you know, when, they're, when they're able to really have lifelong uh, values? And so I don't think, I think we're going to be fighting this as we go. But I, I do think that some companies, you know, hopefully the more companies that don't put up with this, the more government will support that and, and, and um, the more transparent the um, procurement process is, mm -hmm. that will help. And we just have to keep on pushing along, like pushing a rock up a hill, but it's worth it, you know. It's worth it. Is it winning? Is it working? I think things are better. I do, I do. Maybe not everywhere all the time, but I do. I, you know, you're probably in a better position to mm -hmm. speak to this. But from my point of view of, of seeing things, I, I do think that it's better. And we'll come to that, Marjorie. Thank you very much. Matthew, your mother paid the ultimate price for her work in, in investigating corruption um, in Europe and, and where she lives, but also wide, wide, more widely than that. You've been very elegantly and persuasively writing and talking on this subject, um, and you're an investigative journalist in your own right. You've written for us recently on our, our own um, agenda platform, and you write about the presence of Moneyland and the international network, which is more powerful than nation states, especially small nation states. Um, given your unique perspective on this, tell us about how, how realistic it, it could ever be that do small states, large states, could defeat such a, an ingrained international network. Um, I mean, part of my, even long before my mother was murdered, part of my work on the Panama Papers and Paradise Papers investigations I mean, helped me realize that corruption isn't just a wart on a beautiful face. It actually is the international system that um, the, company, the law firms that we were investigating, Mossack Fonseca and Appleby, we're just two out of hundreds all over the world that have created these underground rivers of money that are actually the system. This is the global system. And we're not talking about, um, we, don't, we don't just need to talk about changing culture and education and things like that, but also reworking the system entirely. Because technology has allowed us to move money around the world. Uh, extremely quickly, and that's going to keep, um, it's just going to keep getting easier and easier. But um, law enforcement simply hasn't caught up. And it's not just small, um, small states like my own country, like Malta, for example, but even larger states. I mean, if it weren't, um, if it weren't for the Panama Papers leak, which was a complete fluke, most large European governments would have missed out on hundreds of millions of taxes. I mean, Germany is still collecting, I mean, now I think it's uh, over 530 million euros that is collected as a result of the investigations that it has done into that leak. And this is the result of a fluke. So imagine all else that there is out there that hasn't come to light, that is hidden in this global system. Um, what my mother was investigating was just individual cases tied to, to our country, to Malta, um, of corruption that were facilitated by this global system because we weren't just talking about small-time bribery at a local level or anything like that. It was cross-border corruption. And for people who engage in that, there's absolutely nothing stopping them. Borders simply do not exist for them. You can buy an EU passport for 650,000 euros, open a bank account, get your, law for, get your account manager in Dubai to move your money into the European Union within a day, um, invest it in property in London. It doesn't matter if the money is the result of a drug deal, of tax evasion, or um, kickbacks, no one is going to find out. This system that we have created allows it to hide completely. And um, no, I mean, Botswana can pass as many anti-corruption laws as it wants unless there is effective 
international prosecution for this crime, we're going to remain exactly where we are. Malta is a member of the European Union. It has the best anti-money laundering and anti-corruption laws on paper, but they're not enforced. There are no prosecutions. There's no, um, the European Union itself has very little in the way of tools that it can use to, to fight these problems. What it, I mean, the most that it can do is start infringement proceedings against a member state uh, for rule of law violations. But it, it really takes a lot for that to happen. We don't have to wait for the situation to collapse completely to start doing something about it. Um, we need to start thinking about what international mechanisms we can create to fight corruption at a global level. It's important that, um, uh, that sovereign states create these tools at a national level that they need. Um, but we also need to think about international tools too. A couple of really interesting points there. I want to focus first on the, your role in the, the Panama mm. Papers. I think you were very humble when you said it was a fluke. Um, it was a required, yeah, the product of immense hard work and, and very diligent reporting. But you're, I imagine you're right, there is a lot more out there. Does that not give you a sense of, of, of despondency that the resources are not there to keep on producing more and more investigative work, such as Panama Papers, which, as you say, and quite, you know, quite rightly and perhaps unappreciatively, are, are generating returns for, for the governments that have been benefiting from having this information shown to them? I mean, what, uh, what I think it did is, I mean, when you look at the amount of money that ICIJ, an organization that at the time when, that I was working there employed maybe five people, we were spending about a million dollars a year running this investigation. Um, I mean, when you add the money spent by all the partner um, organizations of ICIJ that also worked on the investigation, 600 journalists in total, I mean, it runs into tens of millions, way beyond the budget of any individual country's um, anti-corruption prosecutor's office. So I think, yes, I mean, it would be easy to say, I mean, what on earth can any country possibly do about this? But I think what it has done is shown um, countries like Germany and the UK that they need to invest more um, in, I mean, crime fighting, let's say fighting, anti -corrup fighting corruption using the same kind of technology and the same kind of methods that we used. And of course, the same financial resources, they need that budget too. Um, Germany has been particularly effective in this regard and um, it's up to other countries to catch up. Um, a lot of it depends on, uh, depends on investment in technology mm -hmm. because um, many police forces simply lack the, uh, the technology and the skill that they need to investigate this kind of crime. Um, very few have I think made the same kind of investment that ICIJ, a tiny um, organization that previously investigated things like environmental crime, um, has made. Um, so I hope that what we have done is shown how it could be done in an effective way. It was, it was a great model and, we, and we, we, we hope there are more genuinely. Let's go back to your, your comments on global architecture. Of course, that is the theme of this meeting as well, towards a shaping a new global architecture. But let's stick with what we've got for the moment, because if you can fix what you have rather than create something new, that's going to be a lot easier. Uh, Malta has great laws, as you say, but it doesn't, have the, uh, it doesn't have the implementation of those laws. Malta is part of the EU. There is a supranational authority there, and you, you just mentioned very, um, again, very persuasively that we need much better international collaboration and coordination. Mm -hmm. Around there, so what are the what are the what are the quick wins that we could implement that could be implemented to, to start making real progress? I think the European the European Union needs an an independent prosecutor's office that has authority. I mean, judicial authority over member states, over individuals in member states. Um, I mean, Europol is entirely inadequate. It's uh, it's a political organisation that functions sort of like a, a call center for the police forces of, of the EU member states. 
is just completely inadequate. Um, even, even with my mother's murder, it has shown itself completely unable to even do the basic thing which, is, which it is allowed to do at law, which is to form a joint, uh, a joint task force that gets the, the police forces of different member states together to investigate the assassination. It hasn't even been able to do that. It's basic job. So um, there's a political will problem there. Yes. Yeah. And right. the thing is, once, once you remove that, um, that political aspect from an organization like Europol and create an independent judicial authority, then you get something really effective. Let's quickly pause and see if really t anyone here wants to ask a question. Make any comments? Gentlemen in the front row. Um, we'll take one or two at a time. So, um, sir, if you could just um, introduce yourself, ask your question, and we could pass the microphone along to this gentleman here. Hi. Hello. My name is Ashwa Ismail. Um, I'm from Estra Wani, Malaysia. I would like to hear from uh, each and every panel regarding the you know, super duper mega scandal of, uh, uh, that rattled the world of finance, one Malaysia development Berhad, one MDB. Uh, you know, governing state-owned enterprise, what is the lesson learned from one MDB? Very good question. Um, the microphone over here. Uh, yes, Mark Beard, um, Basel Institute on Governance. Just a quick comment. <clears throat> We've worked 25 years now intensively against corruption. We haven't achieved what we wanted to go, to go about, I think. And I think you're perfectly right. It's systemic. Panama Papers has demonstrated it. If you look at what we have been discussing the last half an hour, it's correct, there is something to do on the public side, and there are impressive leaders, and I think we have one of, us, one of them in front of us, but we also have the flip side, we have politicians of whom people are totally, um, well, uh, disenchanted, and they turn to populists. On the other side, the private sector is, one has to admit, part of the problem. The private sector has been um, involved in bribery and has now um, got to make um, an effort. I'm thinking of collective action, I think Marjorie, you've mentioned it. But I think we have to be very careful uh, to not to belittle the issue. We're nowhere where we would like to be and we have to be much tougher in the way we are fighting corruption. Very good question, Mark. And maybe, Dilia, you could perhaps talk about it a little bit. Disenchantment. If we know that uh, disenchantment at corruption leads to a dissatisfied public, which could then lead to populism. Why is there no greater political will? I, I think that the problem with uh, trust, and we are facing a lack of trust in institutions, politicians, leaders, uh, is that trust is like energy, I said yesterday. So it doesn't disappear, it reorients it itself. And that's what had happened in terms of liberal democratic uh, institutions and leaders and this lack of trust or distrust has gone to favor populist leaders as Mark was mentioning. And the problem with populist leaders in my region, Latin America, but in Ukraine, in Bangladesh and in many, many countries in the world, in Africa mm. also, uh, is that these populist leaders has um, taken from us the narrative against corruption, but not the agenda against corruption. So they use this speech to say, we are here to solve all the problems in terms of corruption and to get rid of this elite that is governing us, uh, who are very corrupt guys. And then when they are in office, they start doing the same things, but with another narrative. And, and that's the problem we are facing, these populist uh, leaders. One uh, question was um, uh, um, addressing the SOE's problems, uh, state-owned companies. And this has been one of the issues at the G20 this year in Buenos Aires. And for the first time, uh, G20 has received a, a joint message from civil society 20, the C20, and the business sector, the B20, in order to establish some principles of anti-corruption and integrity within SOEs. SOEs are nowadays 
more than 25% of the biggest companies in the world. And some very corrupt countries are running SOEs very efficiently in the foreign countries and uh, involved in corruption. So we have to fight this issue very strongly together with private sector and governments in order to, uh, to have a better and more integrated uh, compliance system within SOEs. And it's not the same as just adopting the same principles or the same compliance principles from private sector because this is not just private sector company. This is the, the resources of the public being used in, in another way as, uh, as usual. Well, I, think so. it's, I think it's particularly um, difficult when the regulator for that industry is also part of the management of the state-owned enterprise, which yeah. happens in some countries. So the very people who are supposed to be protecting the population actually are making business deals in another venue, mm -hmm. and uh, that is a very difficult situation. Yeah, yeah. So how many more 1MDBs are there out there? Our eyes watered when we, we learned the scale of, of, of corruption in that one case. Is it, is it a one-off? Is that unique? <sighs> well, I, I don't have all the answers or the right answers. I think that we have to work together in order to fight against corruption. It's not um, just one office or one court, or one uh, agency. We need to better our mutual legal assistance in order to really collaborate in the investigations. But we, what we have now is that we are facing a 21st century problem with technology helping corrupt uh, deals with 19th century procedural rules and, and uh, agencies. And we move money with the speed of a click in a computer, and we use uh, the traditional foreign ministry communication to foreign ministry, then to judge, uh, judiciary in the country, and then back in order to find out things. So we are not uh, dealing with the right procedures and the right measures in order to face the problem we have now. Mr. President, I'd love you to address both questions. If I could first of all ask you to, to put a bit of thinking towards the one that, that, that Mr. P.F. here asked, because he was talking about disenchantment and populism. And to what extent was your position, and your, 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 your policy towards corruption, shaped by your own vision, your own values, or was it shaped by the people that you, you are now representing? Well, uh, I would, I would uh, imagine it's both, uh, a lot of both. Uh, I've lived in Botswana, I was born in Botswana, I grew up around uh, those values, a very modest uh, beginnings of the country, very poor. And, and to what extent was, it, was corruption an electoral issue, for example, last year? Oh, um, it was a major issue. I mean, the uh, voting public in Botswana was uh, very critical of us in the ruling party. I mean, they accused us of being the biggest thieves in town. And um, uh, part of that, and I guess for other reasons, uh, we we uh, experienced a, a real decline in the number of voters. So um, I took a strong message from that. Um, and it's, it's something that um, uh, I thought we should deal with. And, and we will deal with it to the extent that we, uh, we, we can. But I also wanted to respond in part to um, you know, what I said over here. Um, I think, uh, you know, in, in addition to what my other panelists have said about uh, you know, the, the the inappropriate methods of responding to corruption. We must admit that corruption also fights back. Corruption is active and alive. Corruptors are active and alive. So while we seek solutions to deter what they do, they are in the you know, R&D working just as hard, if not harder, to get at what they want. That you must recognize. Um, uh, you also need to be mindful of any early warnings. Uh, we need, I think, as, as nation states uh, and institutions that um, are committed to fighting corruption, we need to respond to early warning. And oftentimes there's denialism um, in there and uh, a lack of due attention. But I also think the SOEs must also be held up to the same standards, the same rigors as you would 
for a private company in the way they do business. And then uh, you would get uh, the indicators quite early on. You know, I like your point about uh, a regulator being an implementer or, or doer and the, 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 the conflict of interest uh, therein. And it's not an easy task. It, it really isn't. Um, we, we deal in nation states, um, you know, that are quite clearly defined. But we are talking of a concept or, you know, currency or money flows that do not respect or know those um, in the name of efficiency. What we do as a positive, we must know that uh, the same could be done to reverse that fire corruption. So it's just agility, 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 and perhaps even more so building into our legislative framework a compulsion to allow a free press to operate. Um, I, I might add also when we now measure competitiveness here at the World Economic Forum, we've started adding freedom of the press as one of our key indicators for a healthy competitive yeah. economy. Uh, for the first time in 2018, we believe it's absolutely essential Critical. as well. Mr. President, while I have you, let's, let's just ask you to reflect upon Matthew's comments about the need for a better international architecture around Botswana. Botswana mm -hmm. could be an island of good governance, but it doesn't really help in an international world of, of, of fast money flow flows. What kind of conversations have you had with the international community in Africa or further afield? Well, the conversations I'm having continue. And uh, even from the experience of this morning, they need to continue. Um, we're a very small country in Southern Africa. We have many more countries that engage with us. And much as we have our legislative framework almost in, you know, largely intact to try and thwart corruption, we have so much interaction with the rest of the world it could easily undermine that. I mean, you have companies that could come in, and they are present in Botswana, uh, uh, that could very easily undermine what we do. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a real threat to this order that we're trying to put in, um, threatened by the, the undercurrents of the operations of the networks uh, that exist. And I cannot you know, claim that Botswana is immune from that threat. Um, and the smaller you are, the, the more threatened you are. Even our own political stability is just threatened by the capacity of uh, these uh, persons to move capital in the way that they do. And so one of the risks is, is the inward investment you actually need to develop your economy. We do. We really need to develop our own economy. We need to develop very strong institutions to protect that economy. So uh, for us, you know, we, we don't face the same kind of threats of terrorism that you do, our threat of terrorism is corruption. That's our terrorist. Fascinating. Well, we have five minutes left, so let's have a quick last opportunity for questions. Lady at the back. Microphone That's our former Attorney General and <laughs> <laughs> Ambassador. Uh, through you, Your Excellency, I'm the Ambassador of Botswana to Chile and in Switzerland. And I just wanted to underline a point that His Excellency made about cooperation with our, our neighbors. And I wanted to point out that, in fact, the Southern African Development Community um, and the African Union, as institutions to which we are members, have instruments which we are proud to say we influenced that uh, uh, facilitate collaboration between us where we agree on the standards at the sub-regional level of Southern Africa and at the AU level. We have become a center, we, uh, we host the center both the center, uh, the Commonwealth Center on Anti-Corruption through our uh, DCEC. So Mr. President has led the way very much in shining the torch on saying, we are not happy to just do well by ourselves. We would also like our neighbors to work with us, not only be more like us, if I may be modest and say so, but that the whole region can work together to make sure that we deliver the results that we would like to see in terms of anti-corruption and not attract the bad investors who will come here and uh, you know, 
make of corruption endemic. And I, and I think his presence here on this panel now, this meeting, is a, is a fine example. And I'm sure, I'm sure you'll be uh, the, the engagement you'll get, um, and I very much hope so, will be will continue and, and will amplify. Um, we actually have less than five minutes left. We have like two minutes left. So I'm prepared to risk the wrath of Swiss timekeeping just to kind of finish on a bit of a roundup. So 30 seconds each. I would like you all to give yourselves uh, a mark out of 10 for the work you've been doing in the past the year. <laughs> the, year the year just gone. And I'd also like you to outline your, your top priority for the year ahead. I think we've established, unfortunately, we'll be, we'll be coming back to this session and this subject um, in the years ahead. Um, but I still want to give you something to measure yourselves by. Am I starting? You're starting, Marjorie. It's a privilege of sitting next to me. Okay. Um, well, I think I'd give myself a six. Um, I think there's so much more to do, but I think we're making progress. And, um, you know, one, one thing that didn't come up that uh, also concerns me that I'd like to also work on is what Matthew said about um, co opting these institutions that are supposed to be helping, like an Interpol type of situation when it gets used for political purposes. So I'm going to work on that too. Okay. Mr. President. I'd give myself a six and a half. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right, uh, we'll ask your colleagues what, what, what they're going to do. They might give me a five. But I'll give myself a six and a half. And it's because I'm, A, I'm only starting now as the leader, um, even though I've been um, in part of the leadership for quite a while. But I'm revved up. It's the first time I come to Davos and many other um, international place, uh, um, uh, institutions we're going to be working with to try and really uh, make this uh, a big part of who we are and what we do. And um, what I would like to do going forward as a, as a priority is um, not only remain relevant politically by being re-elected so that I can continue, um, but to really take home um, the institutionalization of uh, a non-toleration of corruption. Mm -hmm. Coming from 25 years ago, I would say that the chapters of Transparency International would get a, a seven, I would say. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. 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 And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but one message is clear for me. And uh, you know, when you prepared the session, there was a question about uh, what uh, adaptations had people or are people required to make in order to adapt to corruption? I, my message is please do not adapt, adapt to corruption, not from private sector, not from citizens. We have to put an end to indifference vis-a-vis -vis corruption. Mm -hmm. So please say no. I will not vote any longer for corrupt guys. I will not bribe. I will not receive bribes. Do not adapt to corruption. Uh, Matthew, you've switched from journalism to advocacy. So um, yeah, tell, tell us a little bit about you know, your, how, how you've been doing that. I mean, it, it started even when I was working at ICIJ. The way I think about this is that we attack systems, um, and we do that by going after the kind of most corrupt actors within that system. So the way I think about this is like I, you know, I kind of fight a pilot writing tallies on the on on the side of the plane. You just it's just killing the bad guys. Um, and we just need to do it one by one because there are so many organizations like Mossack Fonseca, like Appleby, and that just have this huge corrupting influence on the world. Um, and we need to go after them for two reasons, to, to stop this corrupting influence and to show the rest of the world what they're doing, which is the education aspect. I'm going to give you a ten. Thanks. <laughs> I'm running out of time, and I'm so certain about this. It's one of the sessions that we could keep on talking about for a lot longer. But it schedules and schedules, so I must um, thank my panel. This has a, been a remarkable session for myself to moderate. Thank you all for joining us here in the room. Thank you for watching us live online at weforum.org. The session is now over. Thank you.